uh, who's the who's the coordinator for the center and will be participating with me and showing you some aspects of the database. Hi, everyone. So um, as you know, the pressure to censor books, to censor speakers, to cancel events, to not allow library space and public libraries to be used by all groups in the community has been intensifying. Um, I think you and BC have faced more of it than in any other province in the country, but it's common across the country. And a lot of it is coming from the South, uh, given uh, what you've undoubtedly been reading about as to the challenges that schools and school libraries and teacher librarians and teachers in the United States are facing. And in some places it's taken quite extraordinary uh, proportions as in Texas where a state legislator developed a list of 850 books and the uh, the governor has picked this up and, and libraries are uh, to be told to account for whether or not they have any of these 850 books in their school libraries. Um, <clears throat> so there's generally uh, uh, a lack of understanding about intellectual freedom, about uh, how uh, the importance of reading and the importance of the diversity of books are for a community. And unfortunately in Canada, unlike in the United States, we haven't uh, had a way of knowing about the challenges that libraries are facing. As Tammy said, each of you is sort of on your own and trying to deal with it. She described it as a particular problem of school libraries and teacher librarians because you're scattered and not necessarily in touch. But it's equally a problem with public libraries. There can be pressure on a public library to get rid of a, a book or not to allow a certain speaker or to take down certain displays. Uh, and there really is no way, or there has been before now, no way to under to find out where else this may have been happening in the country, how uh, those libraries dealt with it to help inform your decision making, uh, other than if you happen to have a network of, of other librarians that you can check with to find that out. Um, the Canadian Library Association began um, a decade or so ago having a challenges uh, database but they it wasn't one that was made public they would use it quite usefully on re, uh, freedom to read week which is this week uh to illustrate some of the books that have been challenged in canada but it was a much less robust version than the american library association had with its challenges database and so at a, a discussion of our Center for Free Expression, where we have a uh, working group on intellectual freedom made up of CEOs of a number of public libraries, uh, of a government library, um, Richard Beaudry, who was chair of the CFLA's Intellectual Freedom Committee, was a member. Uh, Tammy is one of our newest members. In discussions within that working group, there was a strong feeling that we needed to have a real usable database of the challenges to that libraries are facing, public libraries, school libraries, academic libraries, government libraries, and so forth. And so we developed one with the working group's advice, and I wanna show it to you. We began by, we begun by populating it with challenges from public libraries, but we want to, as quickly as possible, include school libraries. And I've been meeting with the presidents of the uh, provincial school library associations across the country as to how we can do that. And in many ways, BC is ideally placed to be the first province where we start bringing in school libraries, which we're ready to do right now. And that's because of the BC Teachers Federation Collective Agreement that has provisions for there being a, a teacher librarian in each school. Now, I realize not all the positions are filled, but in much of the rest of the country, including in my province of Ontario, Teacher librarians are becoming a disappearing breed. Schools, um, as they cut back, um, have to, you know eliminate teacher librarian positions. Oftentimes, there will be um, one official at a board level who's over has overall responsibility for school libraries, but no teacher librarian in any school in the district. Uh, so it's quite an uneven situation. So in many ways, although I'm sure you're better aware of your challenges than I am. Uh, BC is in by far the best place of any province in the country in terms of having teacher librarians in most schools, uh, which makes it easier to begin by populating the database with challenges from school libraries, uh, starting with BC. We're also soon going to be moving ahead with Manitoba. 
So um, maybe uh, if it's okay, Alisa, what I would what I'd begin with is just showing the database and talking a little bit about it and how school libraries can participate, and then really throw it open to questions about challenges and book bans generally, as well as questions about the database and how any of you uh, who have faced challenges would be interested in and would be interested in participating, how you can do that. Is that okay, Lisa? Yep, sounds good. Okay, so uh, I'm just gonna share my screen um, and show you the, the database. Oops, sorry, just give me a second before I do that. I have to do one other thing first. I thought it was open, but it doesn't seem to be. Um, okay. So our database, is on the Center for Free Expression website. And it was designed, for, I mean, our thought was a, a challenge, a database that records all the challenges um, should be at, I mean, its first uh, benefit is to uh, other librarians. So it should be publicly available. So any librarian anywhere in the country, any library anywhere in the country that's facing a challenge can go into that database, see where else the particular book has been challenged or the, and, and see how that library dealt with it. So it's in that sense, it is first and primarily a resource for librarians, but it's also going to be a, a really valuable tool to have a better understanding of the nature and demands for censorship in Canada and how those vary across the country and over time and by type of community and so forth. So on the Center for Free Expression website, which is cfe.torontomu.ca, and Ange, maybe you could just put that into the chat. Uh, you can go onto our website. Which I'll just show you what it looks like. You land in the website, and then you just go to More and to Databases. And there's the Library Challenges database. And we have it in both French and in English. I'm going to show you the English one tonight. So you just click on that. And the database will open up. And so what it has currently it has 307 challenges in it. Um, and you can uh, group them. They can, uh, the item challenges in alphabetical order, or you can do it by creator, which means author, or if it's a movie, the director, or if it's a speaker, the speaker, and so forth, or by library, or by year or by object category, is it about a collection, is it about a speaker and so forth. The reason for the complaint, you can sort by, we have two categories of reasons for the complaint, the action request or the action taken, or you can search. So you, if you wanted to see challenges uh, for uh, items for children, you can click on that and that'll bring up the 106 items, 105 items in the database that are challenges of, uh, of children's literature. Uh, you can search by type of library. Right now, as I mentioned, we just have public libraries. So hopefully within the next few weeks, we're going to have school libraries starting to populate it. Uh, you can see if you wanted to see what is the object, of, whether it's an audio book or the objection to an author or objection to a program or to a speaker, you can sort on those grounds. Uh, you can sort by library or the year or so forth. So what I, what I want to do was uh, let's just take... Um, looking at, at children's books, and I'll just pick one from the uh, from the Toronto Public Library. Um, <clears throat> Good Dog Carl and the Baby Elephant. So for an item in the database, there are two and often three separate pieces of information. The first for each challenge is the summary of the complaint. And so uh, it tells you what was the object of the complaint. In this case, it was uh, Alexandra Day's book, Good Dog, Char Good Dog Carl and the Baby Elephant. The objection was that it depicts small children being unsu left unsupervised at a zoo and interacting with wild animals, which are outdated in illegal contents. And the, 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 the request was to remove it from the collection. So the first thing for each challenge is what was the complaint? 
The second thing, if it was done, and it typically is only large libraries, or large public libraries that have the resources to do this, is any review the library undertook of the item being challenged. So in this case, uh, with Day's book, um, it gives the title, the author, the format, the publisher, uh, information about it, and then a summary of the request. And then it does a review of the material. So it, um, it tells you about the item being challenged, uh, the uh, uh, brief overview of the story, uh, and then some comments from the reviewers at the Toronto Public Library about the history of the, of the book and the history of literature. Um, it then looks at the credentials of the author or performer as background to making a decision what to do. It also includes reviews of the book, uh, more description of the book. It describes the material selection policy that the, that the library happened to use and the underlying principles in deciding what books should be in the library, in this case for children. Um, their policy statement and so forth. And then uh, their policy and reconsideration. So it gives you all that background on the particular item being challenged. And then the third piece of information is the response, library's response. In the case of the Toronto Public Library, they actually have inside, uh, in, in the database, the redacted letter to the complainant. Uh, I'll just leave that up there so you can see, uh, explaining uh, the, li the library's position, how it reconsiders material, uh, what the person objected to in the book, uh, the, re the book was published, and some background and uh, goes into a lot more detail about uh, what it considered and what it looked at and the nature of it. And then um, uh, describes about parents who are concerned with the material may wish to use the book as an opportunity to talk with children about different stories and reality and the dangers associated with interacting with wild animals. Um, uh, but, you know, after going through its various reasons, it then has the highlight of, it, what its decision was here, and for these reasons, the library will retain uh, the book in the collection. So, for for each uh, for each challenge, in other words, there's um, I'll just stop sharing the screen. Um, there is that information on each challenge. Um, I'll share the screen once again and show you an, uh, another. Um, to show you another one, uh, a challenge. Uh, what I want to, I'm showing you two different ones because different libraries keep their records in different ways. And what goes into our database is the material in whatever format the library keeps it. So again, we'll look at a challenge to a children's, a children's book. I'll choose one uh, from the Greater Victoria Public Library. Uh, let's go down to... Um, Let's go down to If I Ran the Zoo by Dr. Seuss. So this book was challenged at the GVPL. The nature of the complaint was that uh, it's very outdated depiction of racialized people. There are scenes depicting or, uh, Orientalism, major area, Asian stereotyping in images and words use of exaggerated blackface character, and the, the complainant was asking that the book be removed. Now, in the case of the Greater Victoria Public Library, uh, they didn't have a material review in the way Toronto did for, for the book we had just looked at previously, but they did have a detailed response to the complainant, which I'll just up here for you to see. So, um, it talks about the library's position, then talks about the author of Dr. Seuss is in the third paragraph, as you'll see, uh, some background, and uh, then a more general statement in the fourth paragraph. There are many books published in decades past that would not pass muster with 21st century uh, readers were they to be presented for publication today. However, these materials reflect an, uh, because they reflect an outdated 
reality or with which we disagree, but they provide opportunities to discuss with children how societies, uh, beliefs and attitudes have changed and, and how a, a word or an image can be hurtful. So it provides an opportunity for discussion. Uh, they then uh, direct the uh, complainant to a post uh, uh, on a blog talking about some of these issues. Uh, the library seeks to acquire recently published picture books for the collection that represent our community's diversity, a few blah, blah, blah. And then it ends because of the information above, we recommend that the book remain in the library's uh, uh, picture book collection. So that's the decision of the library. So uh, some other libraries, I'll just give you one last example, um, simply don't have, don't provide uh, either the, um, sorry, my something's just blocked. Don't provide either the, um, the actual letter to the complainant. I'll just give you an example from the Edmonton Public Library where they have, uh, let's just go here. Take a children's book from the Edmonton Public Library. Uh, it could be The Boy at the Top of the Mountain. The nature, nature of the complaint was a graphic description of sexual assault not appropriate for eight to 12 year olds and should be moved to teen. So the request in this case was to relocate. The Edmonton Public Library provides a summary of its review rather than the detailed report as Toronto did. Uh, the librarian uh, responsible for youth collections has reviewed the title and consulted a variety of library reviewing resources, while the reviewing resources indicate that the book is written at a grade five or six reading level, most note disturbing content and an expectation that a prior understanding of World War II and the consequences of the Nazi regime is essential, is essential to managing the content of the book. Majority of the reviewing resources suggest that this title should be in a teen collection. And then their response to the recipient, again, which instead of giving the letter, they just summarize it, EPL will be moving the item to the teen collection. So I just wanted to give you an overview of, of um, the format in which different um, uh, libraries uh, put material in the database. Um, and I, at this point, I'll just stop before we go in. I'm going to show you about putting things into the database, but I'll just stop for now um, and ask if if anyone has any questions um, about the database. Uh, at this general questions uh, that you might have now before we go into, I'll we'll next show you how you can actually, if you're interested in adding things to the database, how you do it. But I'll leave the image of, can you all see the database? I can. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So Lisa, when I have this up, I can't see everyone very well. So if there's any questions, can you uh, identify the person and then? Sure. If there aren't, you know, if there aren't questions, we can go into the next phase of how you, how you submit material for the database uh, and then deal with questions. But if there are questions at this point, I'd be happy to answer any. So I don't, I don't see any hands raised, or, or if anybody would like to um, unmute and ask a question if they have one at this time. Okay. Nope. Okay. So I'll stop this share. Sorry, so Jim. I did see one in the chat just now. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, it just popped up. <laughs> yeah, it just popped up. Yeah. Um, Sorry, did you want to read it, Lisa, or do you want me to? Oh, sure. Um, it's uh, it's from Mark, and it says, are all items in the database uh, database ones which have completed a formal challenge procedure? No. I was going to ask that, too. Yes. Uh, in fact, um, as we'll show you when we go through the form, that when you want to submit a challenge, uh, it explains that in some detail. We are not limiting it to things that formally, most Historically, most challenge databases elsewhere have just dealt with formal written complaints. But with social media, 
uh, it's taking many different forms. Uh, some of the most dramatic challenges faced by the Vancouver Public Library and the Toronto Public Library were in the form of public demonstrations at the library. Across the country, uh, drag queen story time events in public libraries are being challenged by groups of people turning up and trying to disrupt the event or standing outside and picketing the event. So the database is designed to include all the forms in which objection to content in a library, whether it be a book or a speaker or a program or a display um, or uh, letting community use of the room occur, any form that complaint takes uh, will be uh, uh, able to be included in the database. Were there any other questions at this point? Okay, uh, Ange, do you want to share your screen and, and I'll walk people through the filling out of the form. So if you're interested in uh, having a challenge at your library, go into the database. Uh, we have created this Google form that you see and we'll send you the link to. And you go into the Google form and the first part of it provides information answering some of the questions about what constitutes a challenge. So the um, we record, I mean, it's up to each library to decide what it considers a challenge. And we rely on that. So uh, it can be an item in the collection, as I've mentioned, it could be a program or speaker the library is sponsoring. It could be uh, an exhibit or a display. One of the BC libraries faced a challenge to a display it had about Black History Month. Uh, saying that's not a holiday or that's not a recognized uh, month in Canada and how should you be having it? So they dealt with it by indicating that, first of all, the premise that the complaint it was raising wasn't right and so forth. It can be a challenge uh, to com computer internet use policies and practices. It can be a challenge to space usage. That's primarily an issue for public libraries. Uh, secondly, we include challenges or complaints delivered directly to the library or to the school or to the school board, in person, in writing, by telephone, by email. There's a variety of ways in which an individual can let you know as a parent or as a member of the community they don't think your school should have such and such a book. Uh, it can also be brought to your attention other ways, such as social media. Increasing, we're seeing in the United States, and it's beginning to be seen in Canada, there'll be a whole, there'll be individual posts, there'll be retweets, saying, do you realize that such and such a school has this book and we have, it's got to get rid of this book. So there's no direct communication to the library as such, but the library comes under attack or the school comes under attack or the teacher librarian comes under attack because a certain uh, book uh, is in the, in the school library. Or it can be, it can, there can be an opinion piece in the media. Sometimes uh, somebody will write an op-ed denouncing the school for having such a book. Uh, or there can be protests or demonstrations at the school or at the library. There could be a petition signed by parents to have a particular uh, book removed. Uh, sometimes challenges, uh, certainly in public libraries, take the form of vandalism, where someone will tear the book up and write a message, this book had no place in the library. Uh, we treat all those things as challenges. Uh, and you'll notice uh, there below that are some notes uh, the first one is that each library will determine what it considers to be a challenge. For example, whether the library considers a challenge when somebody complains about an item to a staff member, but no formal complaint process is followed. Oftentimes in small public libraries, the person will come in quite upset about the book, have a talk with the librarian. The librarian will explain their policy and why they have it and why they're keeping it. The person will leave. There was no written complaint as such. But uh, we would consider that a challenge, and but it only goes into the database if the library considers it a challenge. And then secondly, uh, if there's an, it's also a challenge if the identity of the complainant is not known. So there could be social media posts where where you don't know who it's coming from. There could be um, somebody could spray paint the wall of the school denouncing a certain book in the school. I mean, there's a variety of forms or vandalism where the book is torn up. Um, uh, or a, a spray painted message is left on it, or I mean, a variety of ways that people could make known their ob objection to a book, uh, but you don't know who the person is. We still treat that as a challenge, even if we don't know the identity. 
then the question comes up uh, about what constitutes a separate challenge. So for example, an, an individual letter, a personal visit to the library, a telephone call, a completed library complaint form, a social media post demanding that a, a book be taken out of the library, um, and so forth, a letter to the editor where an individual uh, denounces the school for having a certain book in its collection, um, uh, or objects to a program a library is having, or so forth. All those would be a complaint. But there could be a social media thread where I write a thing saying this book is terrible, it shouldn't be uh, in the Vancouver school system, and you know, 68 other people retweet it or comment on it or whatever. Those aren't treated as 68 complaints. They're all related to the original, they're part of the original thread, so that would be treated as one complaint. Similarly, a petition. Uh, we've seen this in the United States where the school will receive a petition signed by 47 parents to have an item removed. That would be treated as a single complaint, although there would be 47 people who signed it. Uh, or a meeting where a group of parents want to have a meeting with the principal to talk about something in the school library. Or um, <clears throat> it can, you know, a group of people protesting outside. So it can be a collective thing involving more than one person, although that would still be a, a single complaint. Uh -huh. On the other hand, um, a if there were 17 separate social media posts objecting to a book, not at one thread, but 17 different people said in their own language, in their own words, why they thought a certain book shouldn't be in their local school library and did it through social media, that would be treated as 17 complaints. So I don't know, I don't know if there's any question just about what constitutes a complaint. I'll stop there for a second before. Is there any, uh, I can't see. Um, so uh, Tom is asking, do the challenges need to be resolved or can the issue be in process for submission? Um, it's probably better to, well, the challenge is, is when the challenge, when the library has figured out how it's going to respond to the challenge, you can then submit it. I wouldn't submit it before you've decided what to do about the challenge. Uh, the complainant may be unhappy with that and may be protesting it, and there may be some further review of it going on. It can still be recorded as a challenge. And if the library subsequently changes the position, we can change the data in the database. But uh, as soon as the library has decided how it's going to respond to the challenge, then it can go into the database. Any other questions at this stage? There'll be lots of opportunity in a minute for more. Okay, so what you will have access to, everyone across the country, every librarian across the country will have access to is a Google form. And I want you to, when you get the Google form, when I first got the Google form, I was put off by the opening statement that Google inserts in every Google form, which says the name and photo associated with your Google account will be recorded when you upload files and submit this form. Only the email you enter is part of your response. And I said, well, Google account, well, the, the reality is you don't need a Google account to fill out this form. We can't erase that sentence uh, because Google inserts it in every Google form, but whether you have a Google account or not, you can make a submission. Also, to it, yeah, and what it'll actually say, if you're not logged into a Google account, um, it'll actually say, give you an opportunity to log in right here. And it's just the placement of this required thing, it really confuses people. So this is just saying that the star, like that is required. <laughs> it's not required to log in. So we did break this up here. Hopefully that'll clarify it. Um, but that's it's just a default thing in the Google Forms that we can't do anything about. Now, so then everything below that is the information that you're providing so the material can go into it. So the email of the submitter, and that's so we can get back to the person submitted to clarify if there's any questions. Because when you complete this form, it goes to our staff who then enter it into the database. And if there's some ambiguity in how it's to be classified or whatever, we need to get back to the person who submitted it. Although that who submitted it uh, we keep confidential. We don't release that to anybody. So uh, your email address, your name. So if, in order to show this, Ange is just filling it out for her, putting in hers because you have to fill that out to get to the next page. And so on the next page, uh, the challenge details. And so what we're going to do is we're going to illustrate. I'm going to have Ange fill this out. 
for the Dr. Seuss book that was challenged at the Greater Vancouver Public Library. So the form of the complaint is going to be a direct to the school complaint. Uh, the item is an item targeted at children. The object of the complaint is a book. Uh, the name of the item, so you'll is the title of the book. If I ran the zoo, the creator, we use the general term creator, that means the author if it's a book, but it means the speaker if it's a program or the director if it's a movie, it's Dr. Seuss. The type of library, it's a school library. The complainant uh, is a parent. Uh, now, if you get a, one of the questions I know, Lisa, that you forwarded to me is what happens if you get a complaint from somebody who's not in your school district? Uh, that would go in. I mean, still pressure on the library. Who knows who they're following up with? It's a complaint the, the school had to recognize, uh, whatever it dealt with it. And so you just click member of the public rather than parent. Um, then the name of the library. Now, in our discussions uh, with the BC Teacher uh, Teach uh, School Library Association, we agreed and we're going to follow this practice for every for all the school libraries. We're not going to list the school. We're going to list the board or school district uh, to provide some protection for the school librarian. Um, and as well, in many places across the country, ultimately, it's the, the school board that has to deal with it. But so any complaint that any of you would put in as to a challenge that had occurred at your school, what you would enter here is not the name of the school but the school district. And then the year of the challenge, uh, the object category, which means it's an item in the collection, the reasons for the challenge. Now the complainant, you can, there's two categories where you can put in reasons, said that it was um, anti, it was racist against black people. I was, oh, I went. And, and racist against indigenous people. So those were the two reasons cited. Um, and the action requested was that it be removed. The action taken by the library was that it is retained. Um, okay, so then you'd click next. And then, um, this provides an opportunity if there's any uh, to provide the supporting documentation. So this is where uh, if you had a summary of the complaint, you would just you know write it up in a word file and and um, attach that uh, document to this that would describe the complaint. That's what we showed you know in the database when I was showing it. In terms of the material review, if your library did a material review as the Toronto Public Library uh, did, uh, you would you could upload that file. And then in terms of the library's response, uh, if you have, if you're going to send us a redacted letter that you sent to the complainant, you'd attach that. If you're simply going to send us a summary of what you decided, we decided to retain the complaint, just write that sentence in a word document and a word uh, page of a word file and, and just attach that file. Um, and then we have the last one. If it's a non-traditional challenge, say your school had a drag queen story time and a bunch of people came in and disrupted it, so it's not doesn't fit into a lot of these earlier categories, uh, you would simply write a description of what happened. And then you click submit and the form goes in. So let me let me stop there. Are there questions about? this form and what's being requested, uh, any information you'd like uh, to clarify. Uh, this is this form, as I say, is a, is a Google form. So it's available to any of you to fill out at any point you get a challenge. Um, the CFLA challenges database, they did a annual survey of challenges. Uh, my experience is at the end of a year, you're doing lots of things and having to try to recall the various challenges you had over the course of the year and the details. Uh, is burdensome. And so we've designed this so if there's a challenge, you can just make the submission when it occurs and, and be done with it. So are there questions just about the form? We went through it fairly quickly, but uh, uh, please, uh, Lisa, just recognize whoever's speaking. Sure. 
Uh, Debbie asks, it's, she says, under material review, is this a review that was done before the purchase or a review done when the complaint has been filed? This would be a review that was done, anything considered by your library in deciding how to respond. So if there was a material review and getting when you got the material, when you got the particular book, and then if there's a challenge, you go back and consult it, then you would include that. So anything you consulted or you found useful in deciding how to respond, or you wanted to remind yourself why you got this book and what its bona fides were at the time, uh, you would include that if that was something you did. She says, thank you for clarifying. It's a great document, it seems easy to use. Any other questions about this part before we? Okay. All right, I'll stop sharing now, Jim. Okay. So what, uh, what in fact, Ann, do you, do you want to put up the, on, in the chat, the link to the Google form? Is it ready to go? Uh, yep, I'll put that in there. Mm -hmm. So this way you'll have that link. And if at any point there's a challenge that you would like to have included in the database, uh, you can do so. Uh, also, Ange, can you put up your email address? So if if when you go to use the form or if you have you have questions or if before using the form you have questions, you can just email them to Ange, who will be happy to answer them. And I'll put my email address in the chat form in a minute and, and you could get in contact with me. But Ange is a real expert on the details of using the form and, and the kinds of questions that have come up. Uh, as I say, we started with five big urban libraries to just test out, find the glitches in the in the database, uh, some of our language, which may have been confusing or so on. So we think we've got it pretty well sorted out, but maybe question when you actually go to use it uh, and feel free so, to get in touch with either of us. So Alana is asking if we can share the Google Form link to the other TLs in their district if they're not able to be here today. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the in the sense that um, we protect the privacy of the name of the complainant, uh, we ask that it be redacted if you send us the letter. We protect any information about who submitted the form. In the case of school libraries, the only thing identified about the submitter is the school district in which the challenge occurred. Um, but otherwise, the complaints, the responses, all that's publicly available in it so that it can be a resource for libraries across the country. Um, and so you're, you're certainly free to. Uh... And Mark is asking, would a list of books considered inappropriate for school libraries and shared by a community group be considered a challenge? Say, I'm sorry, say that again, please. Would a list of books considered inappropriate for school libraries? I, uh, I'm guessing, Mark, kind of like what happened in Texas, where they compiled that 600, 800 um, list of books that that lawmaker found inappropriate and distributed to everybody. Um, would it uh, so if a community group submitted a list? Would that be considered a challenge? Well, this is where we'd really rely on your judgment. That is, you know, somebody could produce a list of books they think are inappropriate and publish in the newspaper or whatever not with a request or any pressure on the school to get rid of them, just expressing their views. Uh, on the other hand, as happened in Texas, or as happened with, as I mentioned earlier, this letter uh, from Action for Canada about the 62 books in the SOGI 123 curriculum in BC, it was clear that they were identifying these books and saying they should not be in your library. If that's the tone or that's the impression you get from the listing of the inappropriate books, then those are challenges, absolutely. Thank you. It is your judgment at the end of the day, though, as to whether you felt it was a challenge to what you have in your library or not. That's what we go with. We don't we don't uh, second guess your uh, your interpretation of what was a challenge and what wasn't. Uh, uh sorry i'm just saying yeah. marilyn sorry yeah. you had a, you don't actually have to log in to fill out the form is it trying to make you log in or 
Uh, yeah, it um, that link took me to um, Google sign in to continue to forms and I put in my school email and then it said, no, nope, couldn't find your Google account. Uh, okay, I'm going to just. And then it. when I press next, it won't go further. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, I, sorry, I'm just going to have to check that out. Actually, I'm going to just look in a different browser uh, for myself right now to see what's happening. Angel, check okay, that out. That's, that's yeah, Firefox, maybe. so maybe that's. No, well, I filled one out today. Now, of course, I have a Google account. Um, so let Ann check that out. While okay, we'll... you know what? I'll check that out. Yeah, I don't know. It shouldn't be asking you to log in to, to fill it out. But um yeah, I will have to look into that. My apologies for that. Uh, so Mark's asking a question that perhaps Lisa can answer rather than me. There was a question. Uh, yes, Mark, absolutely. We will be sharing this across BCTLA. Um, if not in a separate email, then we'll definitely include it in our next newsletter for sure. Excellent. Thank you. I just checked my school account and it isn't a Google account, but it's linked and it works fine. Okay. If any of you go to use it and you have a problem, get in touch with Ange. Uh, yeah, just, just email reach address out. address is ange.holmes at torontomu.ca. I put both of our emails in the chat, Jim. So. Our emails. so if you if you run into any practical problems in using it, you just get in touch with one of us. Uh, it, it should work fine. But as we all know with technology, there are always glitches here and there. So uh, hopefully, uh, one of the questions, Lisa, that you sent me was where is the server what server are all these data stored on uh, the server for this database is uh part of the toronto metropolitan university server so it's the server is in toronto it's under the uh, auspices of the university which has extremely rigorous uh provisions to protect against uh, uh any kind of interference with the database because all the university records and and student records and so on are on the same server. So the university, uh, it makes it as secure as is reasonably possible. But the content, uh, there's nothing, there's nobody has to hack into the computer system to get the content because it's all in the database. Uh, I'm just looking where there, uh, are there any other questions that anyone has about it or things that you think we could do that would make them more useful for you? Yes, Marilyn? I can't hear you. Sorry, I'm just trying to figure out if my problem is that I'm using Firefox rather than Google, uh, than Chrome. I use Chrome. I use Firefox and was able to get in. I don't know, Ange, have you tried? Uh, I, yeah, you know what? I just did it on Firefox and it actually did the same thing for me. So I'm thinking maybe um yeah you may have to check it a different i wonder if you do have to have a google account no it's no you shouldn't have to um sorry i you know what i i will be able to kind of sort this uh, if you wanted to reach out to me uh marilyn please do uh and send me an email uh, yeah, you can send the engine email, Marilyn. So she actually, it would be. Us. I'd really appreciate it if you did because these are kind of as we're just kind of getting the form rolling out. It'd be good to make sure that it's going to work for people across the board to make it as easy as possible. Uh, does anyone else have a question about any aspect of this? No. Um, I think there was one about age ranges oh yes so the categories that we have are children uh, uh, youth and uh, adult slash general uh, children is up to age 12 youth is 13 to 19 and adult general is 20 plus uh, which are the standard age classifications used by public libraries i hope they'll work in your case Looking at the list you sent me, um, 
I answered the one about challenges from outside your district. If your library, your school library receives a challenge, whether it's from within the district or outside the district, um, it's still a challenge faced and it could be taken up by people and you, and you know, if you're, but if your library just doesn't treat that as a challenge, then you wouldn't add it. But if you, uh, I mean, it is a challenge. Uh, and if it's one you recognize as such, then you would include it. I'll, uh, I'll tell you one uh, humorous story. You know, the, the letter, the action for Canada letter about the 62, uh, resources in the SOGI 123 curriculum that were objected to was received by a librarian in a very small community library in Northern British Columbia. So I received this letter saying, if I have any of these 62 books, I'm, I can be charged under the criminal code for having obscene material in the library. She said, so the first thing I did is check our catalog and I found there were 10 books, 10 of these, we had 52 of them, but there are 10 we didn't have. So I ordered those 10. <laughs> yes, exactly. The only appropriate response. <laughs> <laughs> I have okay. a question about the um, the age levels. Yes. In our district, we have uh, a couple of schools where the ages um, go from eleven to thirteen. Would is there a possibility of um, looking? children and youth or what would you suggest there? Well, I mean, I think it really is what you're classifying is the category of the object being challenged, not of okay. the person reading it. So okay, if thank it's you. a youth book, you treat it as a youth book. If it's a kid's book, you treat it regardless of who's taking out, whether it's a 80 year old man or a, a 12 year old. <laughs> thank you. And similarly, on the list of the reasons for the complaint, uh, it's really complicated to try to reduce the millions of possible ones to a few general categories. So what we're talking about there, when you talk about the reason for the complaint, it's what was objected to in the book. So you, you put anti-Semitic if the reason someone objected to it is they felt it was anti-Jewish, it was anti-Semitic. Uh, on the other hand, somebody complained that it's it's a book that further uh, allows Jews to take over the world. They're objecting to it because it's pro-Jewish. Um, you can get people objecting to a book because it's white supremacist, but you can also have people objecting uh, to a book uh, because they feel um, that it uh, denigrates. Um, uh, anyways, I mean, so all of the things we have paired, either anti-Black or uh so forth um and so you're you're classifying not the views of the complainant but what was what they were complaining about in the book that it was uh uh too sympathetic to asian canadians or it was anti it was anti-asian racism uh sort of polar opposites when you're classifying it but it is the object that we're talking about not the person objecting Anything else? I um, I really hope you use. I I would like to have this filled with um, the challenge that schools have had. I think it'll be enormously helpful to schools, school officials, school teacher librarians across the country to be able to have one place they can turn when they face a challenge to see where else it's been challenged and how other school districts and schools have dealt with the material. So I hope you'll take advantage of of this database and, and put in challenges. And you can go backward. If you're aware of challenges that came to your school five years ago or 10 years ago, those can go in. It's not only from this moment forward. As you saw, uh, the Toronto Public Library put in the challenges they've uh, received um, since 1998. Uh, they started there because they, they didn't have uh, a digitized version of the earlier challenges. So if in your school, there were challenges last year or five years ago that you think that you recall and want to put in, please do so. Anything else, Lisa, you'd like me to address? Um, no, I'm just reviewing the questions and I think we've answered all of them. So um, I do want to say that um, if you're curious about how other schools navigate book challenges 
um, probably the best thing to do is to, um, if you have a like a district facilitator, teacher librarian facilitator, if you're fortunate enough to have to have that, um, if they're uh, maybe ask them because I do know that a lot of the uh, TL facilitators do try to meet um, every month, and um, they do share materials uh, across, um, like uh, one district will share their uh, collection policy and material reconsideration form with everybody so they can get an idea of how it um, how it goes from district to district. But it is a fairly um, individual, I mean, it's not individual, but it's like every district has their own process. Um, but ideally, the what you would want is for um, the person who's complaining, especially if it's a parent, is to come to you first. Because a lot of times, it's not so much that it's it's not the person frothing at the mouth that you have a book that acknowledges that LGBTQ people exist. Um, it's somebody is upset at the depiction of um, a person with a disability or with autism. And because, and if that's the only book on your shelf that depicts this, then um, understandably the parent is going to be upset because it doesn't it reflect the livery. It's not the mirror of their child, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the kind of complaints that you really want parents to come to you um, in person and individually so that going through the whole formal process doesn't have to happen because uh, these are things that can be um, mitigated by going through your collection and seeing, do you have holes and gaps and things like that? And sometimes it does take somebody else to point that out. And there is, oh, and Debbie says, Chilek has a really good process for challenge books, which has been described as onerous on the complainant. Yeah. And it requires a strict process to be followed. Um, and Sherry just added that Chilek has a gold standard. Yeah, a lot of when I was writing collection policies um, when library school and uh, so on, uh, one of the across the board, like all the library, all the collection policies that I looked at, rule number one was it has to be, it can't be anonymous. You have to be willing to put your name on it. You have to put contact information on it. It has to be verifiable and you have to fill out the whole thing. You had to have read or engaged with the whole the material as a whole. So it wouldn't be like um, taking one of my books about puberty off the shelf and, or like people talking about Maya Kababi, uh, gender queer, and just focusing on one page. You have to have read the whole thing. And pretty much most libraries that I've looked at, they say if you have not read, if you check no on this, we're going to, we're not going to address your complaint. So, now, Lisa, having said that, could I just add something if I may? Sure. Um, for the purposes of there having been a challenge, however, uh, it would I would encourage you to treat that as a challenge. Was oh from, yes of the database and your response yes, absolutely and your response would be did not consider the challenge because the complainant had not read the book. Yeah, or it was incomplete, or you know, yeah. Or it, no, but I mean, if if the yeah. reason was the person hadn't even read the book, yeah. Uh, so it was a challenge to this item for these reasons, and the library response is, uh, we didn't um, we didn't uh, deal with the challenge because the person hadn't read the material. I can't tell you the number of times that I've talked with people who are objecting to a particular book. Uh, this is universities, uh, and I'll say, well, have you read it? And they'll say, no, I you know I've read about it on social media, a good friend of mine, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, I think we're increasingly uh, seeing that. I would be willing to bet that of the hundreds of the Action for Canada letters objecting to the SOGI 123, uh, SOGI 123 materials, I would be surprised if a single one of them had read all 62 books. I'd be surprised if the majority of them read any one of the 62 books. Uh, but they're raising a huge fuss, uh, which is why we treat, we include in the database uh, anonymous or whatever that come to you. Uh, uh, and we're seeing more and more of that uh, with the use of social media as a way of uh, mobilizing challenges to books in libraries across North America. So uh, not, I'm, not, I, I'm not objecting to the library's way of handling it. Oh, yeah. No. 
share it nevertheless as a challenge and you dealt with it in this following fashion. Um, I do also want to add that um, in September, yeah, September, um, the BCTLA executive, uh, we met with the president of the, let me make sure I get my acronym right, the BCLA, um, mm -hmm. and and they discussed how, and we talked about the Action for Canada letter and everything, and um, they basically, and we issued, or they issued a statement um, undersigned by them and a lot of their partners about um, the Action for Canada contacting school libraries and telling them, you know, that if you have these books, you're uh, breaking Great. laws. And so, um, and if you didn't see that, we did post it on um, our Twitter and uh, Facebook account. So, but well, yeah. And we did the same. I mean, we got a legal yeah. opinion just so everyone knew exactly what legal ground they were standing on yeah. uh, publicly so that nobody should feel intimidated in the least by yeah. And that's what BCLE did was, and, yeah, and, the yeah, and they were telling CFA. us that, yeah, it's rubbish. Yeah, that's right. The CFA, the one part of it that wasn't rubbish um, that in BC, uh, it requires, they, they in, in addition to objecting to those 62 books, they made what is legally in BC an access to information request because they also mm -hmm. requested the, the recipient of this, the CEO of the library or the person in the school board, provide access to any information pertaining to the acquisition of the book. Yeah. Um, now, if, if your school board or school district, uh, I mean, in BC, the access to information legislation was changed recently and public bodies have a right to charge a $10 fee for each access request. And the fee has to be paid before the request can be acted upon. Some public authorities have adopted a $10 fee, others have not. If yours has not adopted a fee, then arguably what's in that letter does constitute a legal access to information request under BC FIPA uh, legislation. And if you have records that pertain to the acquisition of the book, you would have to provide them uh, to the um, the person who sent you the letter. Uh, you should get some legal advice. If you need help with that, you could contact us or you contact the BCLA or the BC. Uh, anyways, uh, you can get some help on that. But that's the only part of the letter that you would have to pay any attention to. Is there anything else? I, I'm just so, I can't tell you how happy I am to have this opportunity to talk with you. Uh, we badly want to have school libraries be a major feature of this database. And uh, BC, for the reasons I mentioned at the beginning, is the obvious place to begin. So I hope that uh, any challenge you face, will you'll start filling out that form and we can get them into the database and up for everyone to see as soon as possible. So Mark said, thank you uh, for all your great work on this. And by the way, the CBC books just sent out 29 books that were challenged in Canada. Yes, um, see during Freedom to Read Week, um, typically the CFLA will release information, make announcements about books that have been challenged in Canada. Uh, the um, uh, CBC keeps some records of it. So that's when this information keeps coming out. And one of the things I'm pleased about up till now, as I mentioned, the CFLA has had a, a, a library challenges database as well. It's not public, it doesn't list the libraries that it has, my, and it's not accessible in the way that ours is. And so that's why we went ahead and they also don't have the staff to keep it going. Uh, but I we've just reached an agreement with them where they're gonna join with us in this one database so there'll be libraries won't be hit with requests for two different databases and so forth so we'll be able to have one single one which will be ours um, and uh ray asked can you please review how names won't be visible in the database so i guess personal names ray is that what they are they aren't in the database to begin with Ange, do you want to address that uh, yeah, any uh, identifying information uh, does get redacted if the libraries can don't have the capabilities to send it to us. 
uh, redacted, uh, redacting it on their own end, we can do it on our end and we just make sure that um, that that is done before anything goes into the database. Now, it think, and if it, when you fill out the form, it doesn't automatically go into the database. It comes to us first. We review it. We make sure it's all in good order before we actually uh, do make it available to the public. And we reach out to you if uh, if we have any questions. Does that answer the question? That That's half the question, I think, Ange. That is any information about the complainant or the person in the library who sends the letter to the complainant, that's all redacted if the letter. But also the question may have been about information about the person who's submitting the challenge. Well, I think we need to know who's submitting the challenge. No, no, I said, so we don't, that material is kept absolutely private. That oh, is, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the point. Yeah. So you need to put your name and email address when you submit it so we can get back to you if there's questions about uh, where something should be classified or anything of that sort. But that does not go into the database. Okay. It's, it is kept in a totally secure, separate uh, encrypted file. And Sharice is asking just to clarify this would not include challenges to the use of particular books in the classroom, only challenges to books held in library collections. Well, I, I'd appreciate your advice on that. My sense is sometimes those two blend together. Um, that is, if there's an objection to a book in the school, um, I'm not sure we'd want, I, I'd, I'd rather the database include any book that the, that's challenged for use in a school, whether it's in the school library or in the, um, uh, in the classroom. Uh, you may have read, I think it was in Texas. Uh, this wasn't the original one where there, what was the 800 books that the legislator warned about. But there was also a provision that, or it may have been in Florida, uh, there was a provision that none of these books should be available in the school uh, or visible. And so teachers in their classrooms had to remove the books or put covers over the bookshelf so that students couldn't see the, any of these books if they were in the classroom. So that distinction between classroom and library, especially in other provinces where school libraries are getting, where, where they're getting rid of teacher librarians and much of the uh, material that would have been in the library in a proper school library is now in various classrooms. Uh, so again, it depends on how your school board or your school treats it, but uh, my inclination would be to include a challenge to any book that's used in the school, whether it happens to be in a classroom or in uh, the library collection itself. So, and I'd also like to add in Florida, only only because I have relatives that live in Florida, so uh, um, that they're requiring te teacher librarians or other school media specialists to do the review of all the materials that um, the current law is finding objectionable, not just books in the library, but the classroom libraries too. Yes. So it's a, you know, blurring lines of, of not just blurring lines, completely obliterating them between classrooms and school and libraries. So actually, Ange, I think that's something helpful for us. We're going to modify the form um, that we're going to make to make that probably clear. So we use the term school libraries. Uh, but we may be school libraries or uh, other, I mean, we'll figure out the wording, but indicate that it conclude it could refer to any book that's challenged within the school, any book within the school that's challenged, whether in the library or elsewhere. Okay. Is there anything else? I don't want to keep all of you too long. I'm happy to stay and answer questions as long as you like. Is there anything else you'd like to raise? Lisa, is there anything else you think that we should there, do before we go? Um, I don't see anything in the chat. And um, please, anybody that has a question, feel free to unmute. And and if you think of a question afterwards, you have Ange and Mai's email address. So just send it to us and we'll be happy to get back to you. And please do share this information uh, with any of your uh, fellow teacher librarians in, in the province. Um, we really do hope to have as complete a, a collection of, of challenges as there have been in the country. So thank you all very much. Uh, Lisa, if there's nothing else? Uh, no. Nope. Okay. Well, Lisa, thank you to you and Tammy for arranging this and thanks to all oh, of thank you. Thank you for coming. 
Well, thank you for coming. Well, here. I mean, <laughs> you've all been working all day, and then you had to do this at the end of your day. So we're very grateful for you doing this with us. Thank you for thank you for agreeing to meet with us. It's been it's 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 really nice to know that things that we're not alone, and that um, as librarians, I know one of the challenges we face is that we're often we feel like you know we are the only one in the building often, yes. and we feel like we're doing this on our own and working with gumdrops and rubber bands and so. Oh, yes. Well, hopefully this will at least allow you to feel connected and have access to what's happening elsewhere. Yeah, in, in for sure. Actually, Lisa, I'm sorry, there's one other thing that yeah. I'd like to ask all of you. Um, I wanted to share my screen with, uh, well, share my screen just to show you one thing. Um, on our website, I showed you how when you go onto the website, you click on more and choose databases. It takes you to this page that that you're seeing. Uh, we have the database in English. It the same database is in French. So if any of you are in uh, francophone schools, um, the material is the same uh, as in the English database, and the content is in the language of the library that submitted it. So. Any challenges that are submitted by libraries in Quebec would be in French, both in the English database and the French database. It's just that the French version of the database has all the instructions and categories and everything in French as opposed to English. So just to, I, I meant to point that out to you and, and didn't. Uh, the other, the other uh, let me just go back. The other thing I want to show you, we have something we set up for public libraries. I'd like to ask your advice as to whether it would be useful to set it up for school libraries as well. And that is the library policies database. So this is a database that we're just in the process of completing of uh, uh, library policies related to intellectual freedom, uh, collections policies, program policies, policies about displays and exhibit internet use policies, room rental policies, social media policies, staff code of ethics. So if your library um, were wanting to see, well, what kind of policies do other libraries like ours have for collections? Or we don't have a programs policy. Uh, it allows you to look and see who does and, and look at their policy to help you. Would it be useful creating a database like this for school uh, libraries or um i will bring that up the next time we meet um okay. and get back and we can get back to you with that okay um, I'm, I'm we sure can easily having, do like, that we can yeah, easily do it if you think it would be useful definitely like the collection policy and social media policy for yep. sure and the um, privacy and code of ethics and all of that and, and and all schools have an internet use policy anyway so yeah. um but yeah it would be it would probably be especially if you're a TL in a province where you don't feel like you have a whole lot of support on a provincial level right. or have an or have a organization like BCTLA, then you can come to the database and find resources. Well, and, so. and also if you know you I mean one of the problems with public library uh, policies is it's often hard to find them on the on the library's uh website. I mean they can yeah. be in other places. They're like buried so, underneath hard. This is sort of one-stop shopping. So yeah. you can see, I mean, they may not call it a programs policy, but if it's a is a programs policy, we put it under that heading or collections policies have different <laughs> names and different, but you can see them. And if you were concerned about the one in your school board, you could use right. some examples of policies you think are good and then raise that with your school board. So, well, yeah. look what they have in, in Halifax. This is a wonderful uh collections policy maybe that could guide a revision of ours so if you think creating something yeah. like that would be useful have a discussion with your colleagues and we'll certainly uh, uh sure. be happy to set one up if you'd like um and sarah go ahead i think you're muted sarah nope or maybe she inadvertently hit the hand up. <laughs> so, but they're, um, so, so, so far two people or maybe three people are saying, yes, please, because if you're in a very small rural district, um, policies may not have, may not exist or they're extremely outdated. And then, um, but, and then it would be a nice way to 
compare policies across the board. And then Ray's asking, um, you're not sure if the school board would like having the collection policy public, Ray? Is that the concern? Yeah. Hi, I am just from a smaller rural district and um, I'm not sure if they would enjoy or uh, like to have that information public that they're behind in their policy development or that sort of thing. It might, maybe it would encourage them to get going on it, but um, yeah, that would be something to uh, to inquire about or to be careful of, I guess. Well, I Ray, I mean, that's good. That's a good point. But the only policies that will go up are the policies that are already on school board websites. So if a school board hasn't hasn't made its policy public, then it wouldn't go into the database. Right, right. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. I do think uh, it would be good, like I say, it's being a smaller rural district just to see um, something to aim for where we should be going, which is would be great. Well, and the other other potential advantage if we're able to build this to include school boards across the country is your board could look at equivalent size boards elsewhere that may have policies. It might be easier to raise it with your board saying, well, you know, this community in Manitoba or in Ontario or in Alberta, about the same size as ours, here's the policies they have. So Great, could, yeah, thank you. Could be useful in that regard. Okay, Lisa, is there anything else? Uh, not on my end, so. Well, again, thank you so I, much to, on behalf of Angie and me to all of you for taking the time to spend with us this evening. And and I hope you will uh, uh, make use of that form. And I hope to see your challenges on the database in the not too distant future. Yeah. Take care, everybody. <laughs>